Good morning, church. Welcome to the Springs. Um, I'm glad that you're all here today. And uh, to the ones watching on the old interweb uh, YouTube, welcome, welcome. Uh, makes me feel good that the pastoral team and the Springs felt that my story needed to be heard. Um, we're continuing our summer series called Stories, Sharing Your Faith Adventure with Others. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. We all know that everybody has a story, a background that shapes who they are by their experiences in life. And it's a very powerful story. Every individual has a story that can be, become powerful. But the Bible also teaches us that we're to go out and give that story to others. That is our testimony. That is a powerful word that we give to others to let others know that our experiences are not unlike yours. Um, I want to go ahead and share my own story uh, with a message that I like to call, You Can't Teach What You Don't Know. So where does one start this adventure in my life? Well, in the beginning, in a land far away, Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> I was born into a broken family um, in the early 70s. Now, I don't have the entire story um, but from what I can gather from my mother and father, uh, my father had some issues with infidelity. Uh, so I wound up actually growing up with just my mother, didn't really know much about my father. Um, it, it's, it's a rough life to go through, um, especially as you'll hear shortly, the things that a child goes through in a single family. Um, I didn't know much about my father, and part of the reason was is because my mother told me on several occasions that your father doesn't want you. He wants to start another family with somebody else. He doesn't want you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't want to be around you. I later, later found out that that wasn't exactly true. Um, <clears throat> so my mother was extremely angry with my father, as you can possibly guess, because of the infidelity issues. And it carried very, very deep scars for her. Very deep scars for her, as you can possibly imagine. But unless you have forgiveness in your heart, you'll never be able to let that go. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a quote from C.S. Lewis from his book, Mere Christianity. And this one kind of hits really hard. Everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he has something to forgive. Amen? I'm pretty sure there's lots of stuff in everybody's life right now that you just don't want to let go because it hurts me. I'm the one that's being hurt. Why should I forgive that other person? So let's go ahead and fast forward a few years into a younger me, starting to ask about my father because he wasn't around. I see other families having, you know, fathers and mothers and living together and all happiness and stuff like that. Um, the typical response is that he didn't want me. Um, and I started to rebel because the damage is being made. I felt that, wait a minute, I know I have a father because I see other fathers out there. But where's mine? And then you're telling me that he doesn't want me. So I had feelings of abandonment and anger and rage. And it led to me starting to lash out verbally and physically, being hurtful and destructive. I was a very strong-willed individual with emotional baggage. And that's a dangerous combination for a single mother to deal with. I was... It had gotten so bad that my mother actually had to send me away. Um, it's called Children's Village. And what it is is that uh, for troubled uh, uh, male youths who would go away and stay there for about a year to help counsel and get them, you know, kind of back into society before they turn around into the juvenile system or possibly into jail. That's how bad it had gotten for me. I was destructive, I broke things, I foul language, took it out on my mother every single chance that I got because I was angry, because I didn't understand, because I was hurt. 
Um, I was about nine or ten years old when she sent me away. And uh, while I was there, it didn't stop. I was still angry. I was abused. Emotionally, physically, sexually. By other other kids that were there. While I was in that place, my mother found a new man. And quickly started a new family without me. Here comes the feelings of abandonment and destructive behavior again. Shortly after I was released, I was there for about a year and a half. Um, my mother actually got married and then gave birth to my sister. And um, this new person in my life, which I thought was going to be kind of cool because, hey, now I got a daddy. Um, he was a raging drunk. He liked to start off by drinking, and when he got really good and drunk, he'd take it out on me. Because I wasn't his. I was just a kid that came along with a woman. And then when my mother came to try and protect me, she'd, he'd then proceed to beat on her. And that went on for about a year. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My mother finally managed to, with help from family and friends, to get away from that situation. But the only way to do that was to send me away again, out to California where my father was living. So I had the opportunity to finally meet my father and live with him and see what his side of life is. But I left with the same baggage. I was still angry. I was still hurt. I was destructive. I, I was just bad. Now, through that whole time, I realized that my destructive behavior was actually pushing people away from me. Because here I was, finally meeting my father, getting, trying to develop that relationship that I finally wanted, to get to know somebody that was my blood relation. But I pushed him away. I pushed him away. I pushed his family away, his wife, my, my siblings away because I was angry. Because I still didn't understand. Why? Why am I being told that you don't love me? Let's go ahead and fast forward into my teen years. Um, my mother had found a third man to finally marry again. And uh, at this time, because I've gone through another bad marriage, I was a little reluctant. Didn't want to, you know, hey, he can't give me nothing. And I don't care what he's going down, what's happening. But this guy was a little bit different. He wasn't physically abusive. He wasn't an alcoholic. He wasn't a drug addict. But he, what, what he was is an emotional person that broke you down. He was emotionally destructive to the point where because I was not his I was not as good as his other children so I would never amount to anything I was nothing because I was still hanging around and being bad and having destructive behavior I was worth nothing to him and he reminded me that almost every day you're never going to amount to nothing You're always going to be who you are right now. There's nothing you can do to change you because you are nothing but bad. About 14, 15 years old, after being broke down, broke down, broke down, broke down emotionally, broke down, I decided that it was time to end it all and make an attempt on my life. I had no one to turn to, no one to talk to. My mom was consumed with the new marriage. She even decided that, you know, it was a good good time to go ahead and tell me, hey, you know what? My marriage has failed because of you. You were angry all the time, so he took it out on you. It's your fault. So I had nothing. I didn't know anything about God, and I didn't care. 
So I stole some Valium from my mom, which she kept in a stash box or pot stash box underneath her bed. And I locked myself in the bathroom and I turned the water on. I stared at the mirror for, seems like hours. And just crying because I didn't know. I didn't know what my life was going to mean. So I finally got the courage to grab that handful of Valium and reach it up to my mouth. And I clearly heard a voice. And I mean clearly. Kind of like Moses. (laughs) You know? He said, you are better than this. I then poured the handful of pills into the sink and fell to the floor in a ball. I realized after I've accepted Christ in my life, that was my first experience with God. Amen? And you would think my first experience with God, woohoo, everything's cool. Nope. I wasn't ready. God saved my life because he had something better for me later on. But I wasn't ready. I still had hurt. I still had emotional baggage. I still didn't know who I was. I spent my late teens and early 20s doing what you would expect expect a no good nobody that wouldn't amount to anything to do. It's funny how sometimes when things are said, especially hurtful things, can shape who a person is. You name it, I was doing it. Alcohol, stealing, taking drugs, selling drugs, hurting people emotionally, physically, womanizing, dropping out of high school, um, giving back to my mother what she gave to me growing up with emotional distress and mental distress. Basically living up to what I was taught that I was going to be. Now I'm not saying I was all bad. I did try. I did try to be a better person. But it's kind of hard when you have all this hurt and hate in your life. It's difficult to keep a job when you're at a job that you feel somebody owes you something. It's hard to have a meaningful relationship when all you have is hurt and, and hate in your heart. I tried to go on the straight and narrow, but I never could because I couldn't hold a job long enough to make sure that I can pay my bills. I was even homeless in Phoenix for several months, eating out of the dumpster behind a Circle K. Needless to say, my life was going nowhere. But I didn't care. I had nothing. And I was okay with it. I tried to pray and reach out to God. But my prayers were never answered. In the way I wanted them to be. So I gave up on God. Hey, if you're not going to answer my prayers. Peace, homie. And I find myself in fabulous Las Vegas. In 2002, I met my wife, Lori, uh, working at a dealership that we were both at. We had a whirlwind romance and got married very quickly. During the first six or seven years, we went through many trials that seemed to have followed me from my past, plus new obstacles that came with blending two different personalities and two different backgrounds in life. And let me tell you, that's not an easy thing to do. When you have a person that's been downtrodden and just hurt, and you combine that with a person who's had a good life and both parents and everything's all, you know, the Waltons. (laughs) You push those together, there's going to be some resistance. (laughs) Because... You can never really know what somebody else's experience is until you've lived through it yourself. Amen? Amen. (laughs) Um, 
one of the hardest things that we had to do early on in our marriage is deal with the loss of her mother to cancer. It was almost a month to the day when we got married. <clears throat> then dealing with addictions from her daughter, losing her father shortly after that, countless loss of jobs, losing our house several times, losing many friends, the list goes on and on and on. But we work through them at a pure determination because I was going to make this work because everything else in my life up to that point didn't work. But I was going to make this work. I love that woman, and I'm going to stay married to her whether she likes it or not. <laughs> uh, so you might be asking yourself, well, that's great. It's great that, uh, you know, that I know so much about you now. Woohoo! But what does that have to do with sharing my faith adventure? Well, here comes a transformation. And what I've learned about myself and God's role in my life. Just a bit over 10 years ago, an acquaintance in the motorcycle club uh, community tragically lost his life in a motorcycle crash on St. Paddy's Day. Um, actually leaving an event. Um, I've been in and out of uh, several different clubs in Las Vegas. So I'm, people know me in the, in the MC world. Um, I was in between clubs at that time, but the president of, the, of a Christian motorcycle club, which he was part of, uh, reached out to me and says, hey, I'm personally inviting you to uh, this funeral. Well, in the MC community, you go to a lot of funerals. Um, it's just kind of one of those things uh, because motorcycle riding is dangerous. Uh, motorcycle riding is only as dangerous as the person next to you. So <clears throat> go to his funeral. I felt that I, up until that time that I had survived on my own. Didn't care who God was. He didn't bring anything worthwhile to my life. Especially considering how many times I cried out to him and never heard back. I didn't feel that he needed me. And I didn't need him. Boy, was I wrong. My life was in an upswing at that point. I wasn't looking for any help from anybody, especially God. I wasn't looking for answers, wasn't struggling with what's this life for question. I was comfortable and content with who I was and where my life was going. But something snapped inside me that day. I felt overcome with unfamiliar emotions and questions, 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 questions. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I in the back of the room wanting to cry but can't? Why am I hearing that voice again that I heard that fateful day in the bathroom with a handful of pills? So I went ahead and I reached out to the president of that Christian club and said, hey, man, I got questions. He says, I knew you would. <laughs> so I said, hey, what do, we, you know, what do we do about this? He says, hey, let's go have some coffee. I said, that's great. You can drink coffee. I drink Pepsi. I can't stand coffee. Uh, so we went ahead and met at a little cafe, had a Pepsi. They're drinking coffee. He brought the, uh, um, the club chaplain to go ahead and just talk. And I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know what's going on. But I tell you right now, I have no regrets. No regrets of making that appointment, of showing up of having questions and having the bravery to say, hey, me in the back, I got a question. I don't regret it because it has changed my life significantly, significantly to the point where I didn't know where my life was going because I thought I was in control. But every time I had a left turn, 
my path would change. Every time I had a right turn, my path would change. I didn't realize that God's path is the only path that matters. Amen? Mm. So because of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and the help of others, I finally understood life-changing verses like this. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And how about Acts 4.12? And there is salvation in no one else, but there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The only way to be saved is through Jesus. Amen? Amen. Only way. There's no other way. How about Ephesians 2, verse 8? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. Gift, not something that you earn. Not something that's yours to begin with. It's a gift given to you. So I started out like most Christians do. Starting out really slow. Hanging out in the back. Trying to learn and not look stupid. I also started hanging out with that Christian club. Which is probably one of the better decisions I've made. As being a Christian. Because when you gather yourselves around like-minded individuals that are yearning for knowledge, trying to be better, get around those people. Get into a life group. Surround yourself with church people. Get away from the filth and the nastiness that you've been. I also started hanging out with other church members, I started off in the big mega church because that's where I thought I would be. That's not where I, God wanted me to be. After a while of going to church and allowing God to make changes in my life, boom, first test. Who's ready? We lost our lucrative business. Now, we both, both started a business, and that was our only income in the house. So when... We lost it. We're a little bit confused and say, hey, God, hello, remember me? You said if I follow you, everything will be okay. No, that's not what I said. I said you will have trials. I mean, come on, God. We decided to follow you and leave our life of degradation. And now this happens. What do you want from us? You want us to be homeless? Do you want us to be Job? So I did the only thing that the old Taz would have never done. I got on my face in the middle of the kitchen and cried out to my king, why? Help me. And I asked for his strength, not my own, his strength. Because what have I done Until then, nothing. I've destroyed myself. I've destroyed my identity. I destroyed what God's plan was for me. But now that I'm on that path, give me strength. Guide me. I learned right then and there, he was changing me from the inside. Because that wasn't me. That guy on the floor was not me. That guy on the floor was who God needed me to be. You know, it's kind of hard because I have major trust issues because of my past. You know, father figure issues, people not loving me. So trusting in something that I can't control, can't feel, touch, taste, or smell was foreign Kind of like a Honda Rebel 250. Okay, for those of you who don't know, that's a really, really tiny motorcycle. Only 250 cc's barely go down the road. 
okay? <laughs> but here I was trusting a God. A God that I didn't know for most of my life. So what do you think happened? God showed up. Now that I finally knew who he was, now that I finally trusted who he was, now that I finally said, okay, God, take control. Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> so within two weeks, I had a job. Lori started working for another groomer that allowed her to borrow the van. Borrow, not pay for it, borrow. So all the money that she was making was her own. All I gotta say is, bam! Take that, Satan. You can't have me. You can't have me anymore. I've finally learned to trust something besides myself. I finally learned to trust God. Now, don't get me wrong, it hasn't been all roses, chocolate, cake, and you know, custom Indians. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Uh, but there's something that can be said about having full surrender. And I mean full surrender. Not, hey, God, handle this for me. Oh, but by the way, I'm going to mess with this one over here. No. Give it all. Give it all. God created this earth. God created you. You don't think he can just snap his fingers and change your life? Mm. Uh. But don't get me wrong. We weren't at a loss for worry because we're human. Over the years, every time we come across a trial, we're like, ooh, what are we going to do now? When our first reaction, we say, woohoo, I want to see what God does with this. I mean, think about that for a minute. Me, rough and tough kid from Brooklyn, abused, neglected, abandoned physically, emotionally, mentally, to trust in God, who I thought didn't care about me. That's where faith brings transformation. Only when I learned to fully surrender to his will did I finally understand that I can do nothing outside of his will. So here's the truth about what God was teaching me. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not onto your own understanding. In all ways, submit to him, and when he will make your path straight. Now, in there, it doesn't say, trust in him, and God's going to make everything great. No, it says, trust in him, and he will set your path. So let's go ahead and talk about some more recent events in faith building. In recent years, we've endured more job loss. Second verse, same as the first. <clears throat> Losing our home again. Our grandchildren even moved away from us. Three years ago, our grandkids, our son and our daughter-in-law moved to Saipan. But God still works miracles, right? They're here today. Yeah. They're here today. How can you tell me that you can't trust God to do miracles? They had a life over there. They're back. Amen. Mm. Through our relationships, both new and old, God has kept us alive and moving forward, sometimes against our own will. <laughs> I mean, who else can take years of anger, resentment, and then restore my relationships with my siblings, mother and father? And when I say restore relationships, I mean after seven, several years, I think it was six, six years of not talking to my mother because we had a falling out. 
And this is a God thing. My mother contacts me at work one day after not talking to her. And she's very sick. I didn't know at the time. But I had a very, very small window to repair this relationship. So I go and I pick her up. And I take her back to her apartment. And I started asking her a bunch of questions. And the, probably the most important question is I asked for her forgiveness for the things that I did to her. Things I did out of anger. Things I did out of confusion. And then I f- went ahead and I turned the table. I said, you know what, Mom? I forgive you for everything that happened. I started talking to her about God. I said, hey, Ma, have you ever accepted Jesus? She said, no. I said, hey, you want to? And she said, yes. (laughs) So I went ahead and I, I helped her come to Jesus. As the Bible instructs us to do, is to go out and preach the word, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I asked her, have you ever been baptized? She said, no. So I then asked her, I said, do you want to be? Because it instructs us in the Bible to go ahead and baptize. And she said, yes. So I baptized her on, that, on her bed that day. Thank you, Jesus. She passed away two weeks after. If God wouldn't have moved in my life, To repair my anger, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to release it and forgive her and for her to forgive me to be able to lead her to Jesus where I know I'm going to see her again. Amen. And one of the things I also learned is that even still when we're in trouble, God not only answers, but he answers in a powerful way. Even this church, my church family, the Springs, this church has stepped up and stood in the gap for us many times. From having the church community come and help us move overnight because we ran out of time. We had almost 30 people come and help us move. Packed up trucks, even wound up renting us another truck because we couldn't afford another and helping us move to our house. I was in the hospital because I was overexhausted. I had a heart attack two years before that. People coming to our new house and setting up my bed so I have a place to sleep when I get out of the hospital. Relationships with church people are so important. So here's something that I've learned along the way. In God's hands, intended evil becomes eventually good. One of the most frightening aspects of being a Christian is knowing that when you put your trust in Jesus, all of hell takes arms against you, intending evil upon your life. So when you finally get in the pathway of righteousness, that's when the party starts. That's when the the demons of hell come up and say, okay, let's do this. But once God has you, that's it. They've already lost the war. All you have to do is remain faithful and trust in God. All you have to do is just cry out to him and say, hey, You see what's going on over here? Fix it. (laughs) I've had the opportunity to go ahead and and baptize a couple people. Um, And the first thing that I say after I baptize is I tell them, now the real fight begins. And it's true. 
many of you can probably attest to this fact is that once you decided to accept Jesus into your life, that's when your battle got harder. That's when the enemy came in and said, okay, I'm going to test you on this. Okay, I'm going to try and get you back. But God says, nope, too late. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So I ask you, have you seen that in your own life? So what about my story has a theme? My trials have been many. My faith is stronger now because of them. I thank God every day for my scars. Emotional, physical. I thank them. Because those scars are what reminds me of who I was. And those scars gives me a story to tell others. Without scars, you haven't experienced life. <clears throat> well, what can be said that God hasn't used everything that I've gone through to show me his way is always better? Because how many times have you said, okay, I got a better idea, God, let me try that. And he just sits back and shakes his head and says, go for it. Let's see how that works out for you. How about until you hit rock bottom, you can't truly appreciate the gifts that are given to you. Or how can you know what forgiveness is until you have forgiven? I'm going to steal this from Pastor B. You love me, right? Yeah. How about forgiveness isn't for those who wronged you? But forgiveness is to heal yourself. Or how about uh, how can you know a better, what a better life is until you go through a horrible one? Or how about how can you know what love is unless you live a life of pain and suffering? And lastly, and this is going to hit hard with some other people here. If you don't experience loss, how much can you appreciate the time you have? But here's where the good news is. John 16, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Hmm. So whatever your story is today, whatever your season of life is, whatever your struggles are, whatever your triumphs, I want to encourage you with a few important reminders. Number one, remember that God is in control. Even in our worst circumstances, know that God has a plan and a purpose for every situation. Psalms 37, 23 through 24. The steps of a man are ordered by God. And he delights in his way. Though he falls, he will not be overwhelmed. For the Lord is holding his hand. So no matter how bleak your life looks, God is working out the situation for you. For his glory. Amen. Sometimes, sometimes your path is going to be smooth and flat. Everything's just copacetic. But every once in a while, you're going to turn around and hit the end of that roller coaster and 
drop. There's a reason for it. It's going to be, bless you, it's going to be abrupt. It's going to be unexpected at times. Yet God knows what these steps are going to lead to. Because in that valley, there might be something that he wants you to learn. There may be something that he needs you to experience. Because that pathway going up is going to make you stronger. And if anybody's been on one of those treadmills that go down and up and down and up and down and up, all you want to do is get off. When you're going through trials, we learn something in riding motorcycles. It's called whiskey throttle. If you're getting out of control, don't let up. Hit the gas. Hang on. Because on the other side, you're going to be going straight. When you start to fishtail, hit the gas. You'll eventually be going straight. Number two, practice contentment. Easier said than done, right? Ooh, how can I be practicing contentment when I'm sitting here in the worst part of my life? No, under, no one understands not having anything better than the Apostle Paul. Philippians 4.12. I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry. Whether living plenty or in want. And here's the secret in the very next verse. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Number three, pray with shameless audacity. Interesting. In Luke 11, there is a parable about a person that goes knocking on a friend's door in the middle of the night for some food. The friend tells him to go away because it's nighttime. You know, somebody knocks on your door at 2 o'clock and wants a cup of sugar. 2 o'clock in the morning is a little early for you coming for some sugar here. Go away. But the parable, parable concludes with this. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So if we tear open this, the idea is that God hears your prayers. But sometimes you have to wait for his perfect timing to hear that answer. Sometimes you have to stay still enough to hear it. Sometimes you have to shut up to hear it. God honors all your prayers. He hears everything that you say, both outwardly and inwardly. He hears that small voice inside. God honors those that have faith so reckless they are willing to pound on God's door if necessary to get an answer. So pray endlessly. Have, shame, have enough shameless audacity to ask God for an answer. Don't just pray for an answer. Ask him, hey, you know, I prayed about this yesterday. I prayed this about this the day before. I prayed about this five minutes ago, and I still haven't heard you. I want an answer, God. At your worst, you'll use the time in which you're waiting to productively ask God for what you want. At best, you'll get an answer, even if it isn't the answer that you're looking for. Number four. Ask others for help. This is where church community comes in so helpful. Don't be afraid or have too much pride to ask for help. And don't wait until it's too late to do so. 
There's a small window of time. Consider the church family. Chances are there's somebody else sitting in this place that has either already gone through it or is in the midst of it right now. Even if they don't have anything specific to say, partner with them in prayer. Be specific in your questions. At the very least, you'll find a common ground with someone. And not only learn about them, but learn about yourself. The more people knocking on God's door, the better. Humble yourself. Let down your pride and ask for help. Number five, serve the Lord. Here's an interesting idea. God teaches us that we're supposed to be out there spreading his word. That's servitude. Teaching others, giving your testimony. That's serving the Lord. Cleaning up trash, putting up tables. That's serving the Lord. There's something about serving others that allows you to shift your focus from your issues and feel good about serving others. You're deflecting what's going on in your life and putting it to use. If you're not sure on when and where to start, ask your pastor. They can help you utilize your gifts. If you're not sure what your gifts are, do it anyway. You will learn about your gifts along the way. In closing, I would like to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And I hope that somebody hears my story and finds courage to take the steps towards a stronger and closer relationship with Jesus. If you don't know what that is, I encourage you to take a moment and talk to one of the pastors, somebody on the prayer team, or somebody that brought you here or listening on YouTube. Members of our prayer team will be up front here and to be able to pray with you in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to have the opportunity to give you a life-changing question. Are you ready to begin a relationship with God? Or are you ready to recommit your life to God? If so, I want, you to, I want to invite you to pray with me. There's no magic in the words. Just go ahead and bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I repent for being master of my own life and living separate from you. I turn away from my sin and I turn towards you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, into my life to rescue and empower me and to restore my life to intimacy with the Heavenly Father. Amen.